Hello, we're back. This is back. part two of our video game episode, episode part seven of two. Geek Talk MD. I'm Moses. I'm Dave for a change. <laughs> I'm Pete and I'm 19. He <laughs> lies like a cheap rug. <laughs> I'm still Andrew. Hello. Hey, Andrew. And those were our special guests. And we're just going to pick up... Actually, Dave, why don't you yep. explain things? Just a, a quick recap. Uh, first off, we apologize for the way we ended off our previous episode, simply because we had some technical glitches, as the video will probably show. So we just had some issues with the technical component of it. We started losing our voices and whatnot. So we decided that we still had so much to talk about that we decided to ask Andrew and Pete to come back on, and we would do a part two of this uh, exciting, exciting episode, and <laughs> and, Ooh, and basically hold and me back, up, and and basically pick up where we left. It was a shame that we got cut off where we did because it was really getting into some of of the stuff that people really are talking about. And so, what where we had left off was we were just talking about where was video games going, and Pete was talking about um, the virtual reality worlds and 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 how the technology has improved to to really help us feel like we're in there. And uh, I was going to lead into a, a social question and then we got cut off. So what I was going to ask the guys and, and you know, whoever, you know, has a, a comment, please jump in there. Um, do you think that the, when people are on the MMOs and they're, and they're online and they're playing sorry, their games... Dave, I'm just going to jump in. What's an MMO? Uh, was it uh, multi Massively. Multi massively multiplayer online. Yeah, massively? Massive. Yeah. M really? That's what yep. they can oh, Wow. I still, say so, I still say some people need to get a thesaurus. Massively as in more than 200, because prior to these new graphical MMOs, there were um, something called MUDs. So I'm going to add yes. some more acronym. Actually, they were multi-user dungeons. And in the 70s, there were uh, these things called MUDs, and they, they're still popular even today. Um, there are online fantasy-based text games and you're playing against other players in real time and right. the population count was probably a, a, a good size mod might be about uh, maybe about 40 to 60 players or something like that it's actually probably a lot lower maybe 20 well, 20 people nowadays. well no even back in the day a lot, a lot of time you'd see that a lot of the mods were actually empty so the ones that did have a population ones that had 20 people on them that was considered you know that's good that's functional when we were playing uh, when we were back in the day when we were playing medivia but that that's a few hundred people around there. but that's the thing okay. so we were playing medivia and medivia easily had a few hundred people uh, on it at a particular time, the, even despite the fact that you know, as you were saying, the, the graphics were limited. We would have to make, you know, go forward, go forward, go right, go forward in order to make it to to certain cities. It seemed rather primitive, but even in that format, there were still lots of people online. That's true, but medieval was the exception, and that was the high end of the bell curve. Um, and there was there were actually technical problems with um, uh, with Vice, which was the oh, the Vice, yeah. Dakota. Yeah, those technical uh, limitations to having more than something like, like 110, 120 people. So okay. you had to really break the code and okay. uh, redesign it to get to the 200. Because um, I, I, mean, I know he was adding extra functionality and so forth. But anyway, it, th to be honest, that was one of my real first experiences with true, oh, well, as you say, it's a MUD or multi-user uh, multi dungeons. And yeah. That, and that was really the beginning of that social um, communication where even though it's text-based, mostly. <coughs> Rice, was very, stuff. Rice was very visionary. I mean, he was a, a professional coder, and he would do this in his spare time to the point of losing his marriage. So he's very dedicated. Yeah. And um, he wanted stuff like, he wanted people to be able to have children in the game, and he wanted ship-to-ship yeah. -ship combat and boarding, stuff like that. I and mean, that was his vision, and that vision was, like, sort of prescient by about 10 to 20 years. It was like, yeah, yeah the technology and the timing. But, something. but, I mean, even, even, to that, even to that stage, even though a group of us were playing, and this was, you know, our, like, at least my, my group's uh, first opportunity at really playing a group game online, um, and we could play it from our own homes and, and so forth. The, the argument has 
been and it continues to grow, I think, is gaming in, in this format. You know, we, we say we're socializing. We say that we're part of clans and we have to go on time at a certain time to do raids. You know, we say it's a type of socializing. But do you really think that this is a valid form of socializing? Go. <laughs> I would, Andrew, I would, what are your thoughts? Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> Just because he was talking last. No, no. Go, go ahead. No, 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 it's, no, no it's okay. okay. Well, you know, this, this question is asked about Facebook. You know, is Facebook a real... Are you really socializing with people on Facebook? My answer to that is it really depends on the degree to which um, you're having deep conversations. I mean, you know, I mean... Uh, I have someone on, on Facebook who used to cut herself when she was a kid and she had problems with her parents. And, you know, we would talk about that. I mean, if you're cracking jokes and posting memes, of course you're not going to much, get much depth out of that. So I think it's, it, it really, um, you, you get out of it what you put in. I mean, I, I hear people slagging on Facebook and I'm like, you know what, you know, I turn my Facebook into an art gallery. I, I post pictures, I, I repost pictures from, from other galleries and I have like a beautiful online gallery. You can make of it whatever you will, you know. Right, right. No, I'd have to agree with Andrew. Um, I, I found that... You don't have to. <laughs> you do. <laughs> I feel that I should. <laughs> Like I mean, Facebook for me has become an inc- an incredibly simplified tool to stay in contact with uh, my relatives because my relatives are like scattered all over the con- all, sorry all over the world. Mm-hmm. So it's far simpler to keep in contact with them through Facebook than to try to call them long distance or to email yeah. them. It's- you know, I I feel like I I agree and disagree because it's excellent in terms of connectivity, like you're saying. I was talking about. Is this actually socializing? You know, yeah. and now when you're socializing, there's a number of factors like, um, let's say, communicating through text alone, right? You're losing all, all the, the visual and, and audio cues of like a person. Is he being sarcastic? So one thing Very we true. talked about is there's no sarcasm font. Actually, I think someone made one uh, well, the last well, that was- but yeah, but. Um, <laughs> But you have smileys. You have smileys now. It's a new technology. (laughs) Yeah, so you're trying to create this new way of, like, um, communicating, but we've all, I think we've all run into the pitfalls of, like, when you're, you know, you send a letter to your, uh, an email to your brother or whoever, and it's just, the tone is all off, and he can't tell what you're saying, and it just, he's pissed at you all of a sudden, um... You know, it, it's a very poor way to communicate is through text. Agreed. Well, I'm, not, I'm Agreed. not saying whether or not it, it, it's an effective tool, but, I mean, is it still a valid form of socializing? Because, for example, and, and I actually I have a perfect example of what you were saying there, uh, Pete, because I was using my keyboard for a particular game, and I accidentally hit my cap block. So I, was, I just wanted to say something to my team, but it came out in all caps. So and everybody thought you were yelling? Legitimate. Everyone thought I was yelling. And I was like, no, no, the cap button. But but I agree, it's definitely a flawed um, tool for socializing. But, you know, is it a valid way to socialize? So th- this is the thing. I mean, there's levels of it, right? I mean, aside from just text, you have uh, guys gaming now are wearing headsets so you can talk to each other. And sometimes you even have, like, the face cam. So you can be looking at your buddy while playing and talking to him. So it's almost like a full interaction short of if, you know... He was giving you short kicks in Street Fighter, and you put him in the headlock, like, sitting there on the couch, you know? Right, right. Well, I mean, even then, I mean, you, for example, uh, one of the tools, you know, that, that's become very popular nowadays in dating is, on, is the online dating. And I, I'm going to a topic, but it's topic. And they're saying that there's a higher result uh, of successful uh, marriages that come out of the people that meet online first and and those that don't so do you feel that when you're talking with someone online in a video game that you have the ability to speak more freely uh with with your team or with with members of of people uh in your group and that you may not necessarily feel comfortable in saying or acting or behaving if you were with them face to face um well, there's a couple of things. In terms of the online dating, there's obviously a mechanism there where you're actually finding people you have stuff in common with instead of a random person you meet drunk at a bar. You're, who right. knows what you're getting? But right. in gaming, I, I feel that there's always 
some kind of freedom talking to someone who may be your buddy online and you've never met, but you can tell him something about your problems as a person who's outside of your life. He's not a, a friend or family member, and it's not going to, I don't know, gossip or anything. It's not going to come back to you. A little you know? more impartial. Yeah. Yeah, but then, then again, there's also the dangers of uh, you know, passing on too much personal information to a complete stranger online. Yeah, but that's not just for online. I mean, someone calls you up and they say, "Hi, you just won this sweepstake. All we need to do is get your date of birth, your address." Yeah, yeah but at this and suddenly they are building a profile on you. But you I'm do, but you do have online predators. Sure. I mean, I was talking about something like a guy who's your buddy online of yes. like two years or so. Your game and your buddy. It's not a random guy you met that day. You're not going to yeah. talk to him about your your personal stuff. You know. Exactly. Agreed. But uh, well, going back, uh, for example, about you, you I know, I know that like that. there's a lot of. <laughs> That's if you really <laughs> get to know him, I guess. <laughs> but even now, with the with the large conventions that they have, and now they're bringing in forty, fifty thousand people to like World of Warcraft or uh, World of Tank competitions, and and these things, and people are getting an opportunity to meet face to face some of the people that they've been playing with for multiple years, and they and they end up being lifelong friends. I mean. Again, they they met random people, you know, that were part of their clan or guild or whatever the, the term is in the game, and they built these friendships and and they turned into real life uh, friendships. Now, that being said, you know, whether or not it's an effective tool to socialize, you know, I like personally, I feel that it's it's a good tool. Regular socialization doesn't allow me to achieve. When I'm talking in a, if I'm if I'm going to a party and I'm meeting people, I'm technically meeting people one at a time or a small group of people at a time. And so, therefore, through the course of an evening, maybe I have met and remembered maybe ten people out of the fifty or so I may have met. Whereas when I meet people online, someone may say something, and I'll keep track of of them and and you know adventure with them and and build longer stronger relationships because i've done something with them you know i've I've done an adventure with them i've 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 completed a quest with them and that seems to me to know whether or not it's real or not a stronger bond than if i just met them at a bar and i and i've forgotten their name yeah i mean yeah yeah you know maybe because um because there is that freedom to either like or dislike people you know either you like them in the guild or you don't like them in the guild it doesn't really matter because there's a lot of people to to work with or not to work with and i you know i think it's a great way of socializing yeah i i think it ties in with your your whole thing about internet dating you know because you're really zooming in to what kind of a person you want to talk to you know it's not just a random person you're meeting online on a chat room it's someone who's interested in uh, role playing whatever in a video game and then you create a guild that's based on say Monty Python characters so now this is a guy who <laughs> likes video games that's and role playing and Monty Python what's the chances you're going to find that guy in a bar <laughs> what not you know no, I, I had thought of that, that, that part of it but you're 100% right that you know there are groups that you know they, they put you know in their in their description you know what they're into or what they like or what they're looking for and you know yeah. they grow sounds like a dating profile doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> must love I've, dogs but it makes <laughs> sense though yeah it's a way to connect with people who yeah. are interested in what you're interested in that's what's great about it you know but it, it's it, i'd say i'd say in the long run it's just like any other thing that you would classify as a tool it depends yeah. on the circumstances in which you're using it it depends on how you're using it and it depends on what the res- on the results you get and also, it also depends on the, the people who are well, the other people who are using it. I think okay. it, another thing is that um, you have to take factor in the account that the the kind of birth and, and life and evolution of the internet. For example, we were talking about muds, and in the late nineties, I found that the the anonymous nature of the internet, and because it was difficult to uh, to sort of type in the text commands and actually uh, play these muds, the muds were them were sort of a bit of an underground for university students and uh, but the internet is a constantly evolving entity and um, for example we were talking about MUDs and in the late 90s it was uh, very difficult it was difficult to, 
I heard myself echo, so it's yeah. throwing me off. The thing that you also factor in is that the internet is a constantly evolving entity. So, for example, early on we were talking about MUDs, and in the late 90s, it was pretty difficult to uh, connect to the internet and play these online games. There was no graphical user interface. There was no, no real browser. People well, would use something called Telnet, and they'd use esoteric commands, yeah, just like true. DOS, to, to connect. And... The only reason I found out about that game is from a fellow student, Theo, who was in the electric, yeah, yeah. electric engineer. And I think that I found out about it. I told Dave, and Dave told his friends. And so on and so on. Yeah. So back then, it, it, the internet was a realm for um, college Pardon. students, university students, hackers. Yeah. Uh, so it was, an, it was an underground scene. So when you, when you were socializing, um, the fact that it was anonymous did lend itself to people... Um, really confessing about what was going in the, on in their lives. It was very much like a confessional, like in a religious sense. Well, it still is. You know, I mean, well, that's the experience. thing. Exactly. Difference, it's a bit different uh, with Facebook because, for example, like I posted something on, on someone's page and the fact that that person has so many people on her page, she didn't like what I wrote, right? She said, I always, I always write and express myself you know, without a filter kind of thing, but she mentioned she had college professors and, and stuff like that on that page. So she's rem- worried about uh, how she looked professionally. So that aspect just didn't exist in, like, the late 90s or even before, really, Facebook. Um, even back in MySpace days, like, people weren't too concerned about stuff like that. But, I but, mean, so it's a different different kind of scene now. Well, it, it's true, and, and actually you touched on a very important point as well, because, you know, there are a lot of uh, conditions, like for example, there are a lot of legal situations nowadays where the lawyers will actually give advice not to post certain things on uh, Facebook because of the lack of control and, and you know, what, what that might end up, what that might make their clients end up looking like. Oh, yeah. Mm. And, uh, you know, you know, if someone is supposed to be grieving, but yet they went on vacation to try to get over their woes, and they should happen to show a smile, then suddenly their entire case could fall apart based on that one picture that they had up on Facebook. And well, yeah, also, I mean, much like I've, the NDAs that uh, most employees have to sign nowadays. Uh, well, you're, that's you're just basically an extension. A, of- yeah, but you're basically in a situation... Where a lot, like I'm finding with coworkers that I'm like in in contact with on Facebook, where I'm constantly having to remind them, guys, if our employers ever come across any of this, you're toast. You don't, you don't. There's certain things about ju- your work you do I not mean, post. We're coming yeah. off topic. We're, we're coming Pause. off. To- we're going a little bit off topic with regards to video games, but the point is that you know. This is turning into a bigger problem, and I'm not sure if there's necessarily a fault or, or who's at fault, but the reality is that this is a public social networking system, and when people put private information up there, not thinking about that, that's kind of, you know, it, it's a separate problem, but with regards to video games, that still holds true that you can put too much personal information in your video game and in, be it in your in your character name or your character name or your clan name or your clan description and there can be all kinds of consequences that, that push back from that and then if you tie that in with the games that you can play online with Facebook you tie those two things together and suddenly you know you have one world that you're being very careful about not giving online information uh, accidentally touching this public social media and suddenly everybody knows about what you previously had intended to stay private. Yeah, I think there was an example uh, with Facebook um, and this may be a bit of an exaggeration. I'm not entirely certain of the details of the story but I seem to recall uh, seeing it on the TV news that uh, this uh, little girl, her parents uh, put out invitations for her birthday party on Facebook but they didn't pay attention to who, to how they put it out, so it was ma- it was public instead of just yeah, specifically. Dis- and something uh, like a few hundred people suddenly showed up in this family's <laughs> yard for this little girl's, bir- you know, you know, kitty bird party. Well, I heard there was alcohol involved. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, exactly. and all yeah. kinds of stuff. And the police had to get co- had to be called in. But again, now who's obviously we can't blame the tool because it's just the tool, so therefore it has to be the user. Right. Well, the the user and also the receiver. There, I mean, the user the user should have, you know, understood 
the parameters of the tool. But the people who got that should have actually exercised a certain amount of common sense. You know, this is a birthday party for a 10-year-old kid or whatever age that kid is. I'm probably not invited. This was a mistake. Okay. You know, to try to steer this uh, back a yeah. little bit, Let's steer going back. Back, <laughs> back to what you and Andrew were saying about, you know, the evolution. When we were talking about Medivia, yeah. so I remember finding out Medivia because of Dave. I mean, we were sitting there. I think we were playing... Um, Champions at the okay. time. Oh, I remember Dave, that game. Yeah, and Dave was over on the side on the computer. He's like, what's he doing over there? And I go over and he's like, you know, uh, open bag, put this in bag. I'm like, what? So it was for, I just found out about, I just actually found out that Andrew is responsible for telling Dave who killed me, <laughs> which is really cool. So thanks for that, Andrew. But yeah, um, no it reminded me, uh, before that, I was actually going on to, you know, BBS boards, right? Which was... Uh, bef- yeah, uh, bulletin board systems. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so you would just dial in with your, your modem through your phone, and it would be <laughs> like... External modem? Yes, right? <laughs> Remember your the phone, noise? Your funny noises and all that <laughs> stuff. But it was really cool. There was a game on there called Legend of the Red Dragon. Okay. So it was kind of like... It's not an MMO, but it was a precursor to MUDs, even. <laughs> so you had a lot of guys online let's say but you couldn't interact with each other per se at the same time but you would have your own guy who will do adventures and build up and then you could attack other players but in a stationary type of way right so, but that's what was really cool about bbs is i remember one time uh you know i was just going nuts playing this, these games and it turns out i had racked up like a 150 dollar phone bill Oh. for my parents <laughs> it was like oh my god i had no idea at the time you know because exactly. I mean, the first time I got on one of these boards, like, I, I was on the computer, right? Yeah, and I yeah. get someone up, and I'm talking to them on the computer. Yeah. This was a real, like, when you're talking about the, the evolution, right? And I called my parents into the room. It's like, guy, guy, check this out. I'm talking to someone on the computer. I'm like, what? Watch this. <laughs> Hi. And then the person would react. It's like, oh, wow, look at that. You know? <laughs> it's alive. It, it was so crazy, you know? Yeah, but, no, uh, it's true. Yeah. No, so it, you look it, at where we're really, at now. Yeah. When you look at where we're at now, the younger generation doesn't know what that's like. You know what I mean? They're no, everyone. I mean, if you look at uh, today's generation, they never had that. Everybody today, they're they're inundated into this social networking from you know you're six years old with a cell phone and you're off Facebook. You know. Well, you know that's a really good point, and I think it it really does put a focus on you know kids that are growing up today, and I'm not, I'm not saying that just to be old. But I'm saying that because there has been such a huge change over the just the past few years that, you know, I used to call my, I, my family in Trinidad, in, you know, during Christmas because, you know, we would call as a family, call everyone there as a family. We may or may not get in the first time, so we may have to call a few times mm. just to say Merry Christmas you know, from Canada to the Caribbean, and, you know, how is everybody and everything, and we try to cram all our entire conversation in as few words as possible, just so that we don't rack up gigantic bills, and and this was our limited, our, our best but limited form of communication with the Caribbean, and now here is this generation that can accidentally carry on ongoing, anytime, day or night, conversations with anybody in the world, either through telephone, phone, text, or even visual, as were you doing with Skype, uh, communication at any moment, even yeah. mobile through the phone. Yep. It's weird that everybody, that's just the status quo now. Everybody's yep. got that now. You could get that for free at the library. You know what exactly. I mean? You could go use the internet. Now, here's the thing. With video games, I noticed... Something like um, Candy Crush. You guys know Candy Crush? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So now people who were not video game players, because yeah. of this connectivity that we all have through Facebook, mm-hmm. suddenly are playing video games for the first time, albeit the worst possible video games. They're in there, you know? Well, actually, I think, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier in the previous episode. But uh, just, just the, with regard to the game, and I think the very first game that did that for us was Tetris. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, no. And... Actually, I, I'd say there was another one that was a bigger problem. Um, it was, it was, I, I remember it was a game that you showed me, and I found out later, uh, what was it called? Um, Lemmings! Oh, Lemmings. No, 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 no but, but, but Tetris was definitely the, the, the one that, that really got people going because of how many systems it went on, how quickly it went on, and how 
like pretty much any new device, any new electronic game had Tetris on it. You could have the most basic phone. It could have been a flip phone. Yeah. And somehow they had Tetris on it. <laughs> yeah, but I recall at one point uh, there was a, a version of Lemmings that was making the rounds all over the place and that there was a big problem that there was actually some kind of a Trojan horse or a worm or something attached to it. Well, and tons of people were getting... They were basically getting their hard drives wiped just no, because... No, no, no. I, I, I never heard that from Lemmings, but there were, uh, like, around holidays where oh, there was one Elf particular bowling. game with called Elf Bowling. Elf Bowling, yeah, yeah. That got very popular, and that was a Trojan horse. And and there were others like that. And, and I agree that, that people started playing it and got addicted to it, at, playing it at work and and, play, and downloading it onto their work PCs. you got to admit, it was a funny pictures. game. <laughs> it was a great game, but <laughs> who's your daddy? Slap, slap, slap. Who's that's daddy? the point. That's exactly the point. And and you know this is what gaming has become now is that you know uh, Angry Birds. You know exactly the same way through word of yeah, mouth, yeah. and it caught on like crazy. And now and then my, and then um, Minecraft. Shortly oh, thereafter, yeah. you know afterwards. I mean, my, Minecraft is everywhere on, on every device. Well deserved though for Minecraft. It was. Yeah. I mean, for for what he did. You know, it was incredible. And as a matter of fact, I think Minecraft is probably one of the best tools to transition into some of that virtual reality wear because what that character can do in Minecraft isn't that complicated to how we can translate that into a virtual world. But that that's I'm just throwing that out there, I'm giving them an idea. If it makes a million dollars, they can definitely send a percentage my way. But, oh if only. <laughs> you know what's sad about the designer who did the Tetris, the Russian guy? He never got paid his dues. I know. It was this, no, no, no. It was this manager a wheeler dealer who made all the money. And what's sad is that Ever since Tetris, he's been and then and create the next big thing. And you know, Tetris was what, like what early '90s or something like that. Yeah, I don't remember. Yep. Well, yeah, I mean, he, lost, okay. he lost the rights. Yeah, but th- but that's but that's been the case with most techno with most big things over the years. I mean, for goodness' sake, Alex, uh, the Alexander Graham Bell didn't uh, didn't actually invent the phone. He stole the patent from an Italian engineer uh, whose name escapes me. Uh, and the only reason that this poor guy didn't get the patent back was because the day before he was supposed to have his day in court, he died. But you're, you're talking about telecom? No, telephone. Okay, but there was someone in Canada that did it before he did, but well, he didn't get the patent in time. Yeah, this is the case with everything. I mean, almost everything is stolen, and it, it's so tough to do. I mean, you know, the automotive industry, but you know what really pisses me off? Is what gamer- really pisses you off? What is really gamer- pisses Gamer girls. Okay, gamer girls. gamer girls. You don't candy know that. Crush. It's well, girls. Oh. Those are the girls that play the Candy Crush. That's, that's no, no, no. No, you're talking about the girls at the at the conventions and such. Girl, that, girls that, that play video games. Okay. Now oh. here's the thing. I have no problem with girls playing video games. What bothers me is where were when I was a kid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because that all of a sudden, a old man? Is that what you're all saying? of a sudden, you see these guys who are like these pro gamers. It's that's the craziest thing. Everything I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be like a pro gamer. Imagine you could play video games for a living. You know, it's your parents would probably smack you for even thinking something like that, like you're lazy or something. But now that's a reality. So you probably will still get. You probably will still. Well, get yeah. That, but well, I mean, when you, I mean, again, again, j- just like what we were talking about with people getting ripped off over creating some technology. I mean, this, yeah. this is this, the same thing. I mean, who would have ever guessed that you know Tony Hawk, you know would have ended up yeah. becoming a millionaire just for skateboarding. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Well, true. And I mean, uh, it's, you, you, you might get the smack until Tony Hawk comes out, and then you see the money, and then the parents see it, and they say, oh, wait a minute, this is actually a viable uh, career for this kid, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I mean, he, he, was, he, he was already a multimillionaire, you know, yeah. and bought a mansion when he was still in it, before he was even old enough to drive a car. Right, right. And it's the same thing with um, a lot of uh, gamers, because there's gamers out there, they're making six figures playing video games, not to mention, you know, full endorsements that they're getting the best free computers and all this stuff from companies, and they're endorsing stuff for them. And, I mean, um, the real thing is gamer girls. This is what bothers me, okay? (laughs) Didn't you already say that? Yeah, 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 but I I really want to stress this point, (laughs) because... (laughs) 
because okay, can, I mean, can, can we can we please stop this from degenerating into a lament about the Since lack of the lack of uh, poontang you got as a kid? Well, <laughs> well no, Since no. Since we're no, talking about not, social consequence, consequences, uh, what do you guys think about swatting? I mean, that's something that was okay, unheard of. Uh, forgive my ignorance. What is swatting? Uh, swatting is when someone, it, usually in the states, basically they call up the SWAT team and um, tell them to go to an opponent's place, and they basically phone in a fake bomb threat. Yeah. So it's saying such and such is is uh, is building a bomb that's going to blow everyone up. Are you kidding me? No, no. This, this is, is very this real. Is a, this is a real I, thing. I, I and yeah, well, I'll send you a view after. Think about how prevalent it is. There's even a saying for it. It's called swatting, right? Yeah. Wow. This is how much it happens. It's just such a, you know, you can call it trolling, incredibly irresponsible, deplorable kind of thing to do. There's, let's say, um, it's happened to some pro game. I think his name was um, uh, Zero Nothing. What's his name, Andrew? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. It, it, it's a certain pro gamer who's one of the guys that, you know, they just don't like what you're doing in the game. This is because of video games, really. Yeah. They don't like what you're doing in the game, or as a pro gamer, you might have said something. And so they actually will call the police over a, a VOIP line, so they can't be traced, mm -hmm. and tell them some kind of terrorist or bomb threat is at that person's address, which they looked up over the internet also. And they get an actual SWAT team raid their house, kick in the door with machine guns. And maybe you know, kill their dog on the way in, and you know, and you know what? You know what? This is part of part of what we want to talk to. I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about you know the evolution of gaming and, and the and the mods and the and the um, the MMOs and so forth. But now, you know, this is really touching on the fact that you know, gaming now is turned into a business, not just for the gaming companies, but all of the ancillary uh, businesses. Like, for example. Um, when 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 you're playing a, a, an online game, you can you can mine you know resources and then actually sell those resources in the game in auction or on eBay or whatnot, and people will pay real money for some of these resources. And so playing a role playing game, and you know if I want or if I could spend you know endless hours mining for some rare mineral in some game. People would be interested to actually purchase this in real money from me, yeah. and I can make a business of it. Or I may get some legendary weapon that's so hard to get, and I could sell it. Didn't they do a gag like that on Big they, Bang Theory? They, they did do a gag on that, and they did do a, a bit on where some guy hacked uh, Sheldon's stole, account. Yeah, and stole um, all of his treasures from his game, but, yeah. but and, and that happens too. But what I'm talking about is just the, the outside economics of... Well, yeah, uh, that, he, that he actually that, that he put the, the the sword of Azeroth or whatever it was yeah. on eBay. Yeah, yeah, but this is happening. Wow. There's there's a real life so situation. I've seen that, that goes the the uh, the concept of making money in a virtual video game. I've seen that taken to an extreme where a guy he second mortgage on his house so that he could buy, try and club in this game. Are and you fucking people, kidding me? No, it's for real. I forget the name of it. It's actually. Uh, popular to the point where like, famous celebrities will will play in this game under the guise of different names. But in the game, um, you get to rent out... If you own a motel, you can rent out the rooms. And w the way it works is that people are playing, vir paying in virtual money, but in order to, to buy that virtual money, they have to use life money. So it's kind of like the... The casino, uh, real money and chips, or in an arcade, the yeah. the oh, credit, credit coins and things. So that's how that transition works. So, but it's funny to see the, the kind of bidding war that would take place. I mean, this guy was was bidding against this other guy because they're having real time auctions for for real estate in, in in this game. I think it started out with a nightclub, and then it 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 got as big as like trying trying to get a a motel. And these these two guys with who were taken out mortgages on their real houses to, to, to buy this the virtual assets and they're making real serious coin in this, in this game too so it's kind of funny to see how it's got to that extreme and it sort of started out with like just casual one person designing cosmetics in, in a game like Second Life so hmm. it, which was popular like for, for women so they would design uh, say a boots or um, a sweater or whatever, and they're selling these as, as items in the game to something as extreme as taking out mortgages on on, on the house. And um, yeah, there's a, a lot of other crazy stories like in Eve, but I mean, those are the extremes. 
I mean, well, there, are certain ta- ga- there are certain games that certain people gravitate towards, like like building or designing type games, and I find that those are the most notorious for this type of thing. There was a game I used to play a while ago. Um, uh, what was it? It was Star Wars uh, Galaxies, I think it was. Yeah. And and then eventually they changed it, and it became terrible after that. But but the original game was really awesome. Why they added Jar Jar Binks? No, 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 no. <laughs> It was before that, but okay. the thing was is that you could do you could build um, you know weapons and armor and and artwork and houses and all these pretty much anything and everything you would u- anybody would use within the game, and depending on the quality of the materials, you know it, it was it was granular. So you know you build a component, and depending on the materials you use, you can build a really great component. And then if you use really great components in a, in a certain gun, you might be able to make an even better type of gun. So there were certain smiths that were grinders that would get the best materials to build some of the best weapons. And they would sell their, their upgraded top-notch armors and weapons um, for real-life cash in, in, about the, in the Star Wars universe. And the same thing for, for these unique houses and these unique... Um, Speeders and and this is and so forth. You and think that's crazy? <laughs> what, do you know about in um, World of Warcraft? There's something called like the Chinese gold miners. Okay. You, you're talking about the ones that uh, that uh, like every once in a while pop up and say, you know, do you want to buy you no, know, like a million? No. Okay. No. What happens is, I never really played it, but this is from my friends have told me who play World of Warcraft. Because you, you go out mining gold, right? Mm-hmm. But if you look at the, the, the living standard in some countries, mm-hmm. actually going in, mining gold inside Warcraft, they're making a lot more money than they would actually working in the country, which China oh, is one of the examples. So the servers would have all these guys. That's all they do. And like, instead of being in like a sweatshop or something, they're supporting their families by mining gold and selling it in World of Warcraft. Absolutely. How much of a trip is that? But, but it gets even more surreal because China was using prisons to do that. So by day, it was conventional, like using a pickaxe to, to hammer the rock to mine like real-life resources. But by night, they would play World of Warcraft and they're, they're still working inside the it, game. It's, and it's not- they would give that, that money to the prison system. I'm sorry, did you want to add something to that, Dave? Well, I was just going to say that it's not just China. I mean, I've heard huge shops in the Ukraine. I've heard huge shops in Russia where they literally have, you know, abandoned um, uh, factories and so forth where they've got the workers in there and they are mining for ores. They're mining for rare items, rare pets. You know, whatever is rare in a particular game, be it Star Wars, World of Warcraft, um, you know, whatever it is. And okay, uh, and they're guys, acquiring these things and selling them. Okay, guys, let's um, move on. I don't. I, I mean, this is a really good subject, but uh, yeah. we're going to start running short on time. So, um... Well, well, actually, I just, no, I just want to say since, that... Sorry? I just want to say that I think that like, the, the big budgets that are thrown into these games was kind of like the death of gaming. Because, I mean, once they started throwing these Hollywood side bud- budgets in, they were just looking for the like the you know the the Call of Duty or whatever five thousand you know one two three four five six seven, and uh, innovation got killed basically. Well, actually, okay. that's just where I was going to steer this. But was you said Hollywood? Agreed. Sure. I mean, I mean, um, the, the the budgets for the game are massive. Yeah. Well, not not just that, but now I mean, video games are now becoming oh. movies, and well, also there are movies being made of video games. But more importantly, what Andrew's saying is the video game industry has far surpassed the movie industry in revenue. Uh, it's actually surpassed the movie and music industries combined in revenue. If you look at it, it's insane. With it's video insane games. how much money he's making. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because um, Plus, you start looking at the budgets of some of these games. You know, you're, all the, the major games coming out, you know what I mean, from now on, let's say, mm-hmm. you're looking at... Two hundred million plus dollar budgets. And plus, they are practically movies in and of themselves. Well, I mean, I mean uh, a, f- a friend of mine pointed me- pointed out to me a link to YouTube where I could watch the actual movie that of the gameplay of the Arkham Asylum games. Oh yeah, and I was just blown away at the at the. Qu- I mean, it was practically a, an an animated film. Well, I, I mean, remember. World of Warcraft. Uh, uh, Call of Duty, Halo have all produced small 
shorts and short movies using their existing technology to develop graphics and sound. I remember uh, it first really hit me when I started playing Oblivion, right? Mm-hmm. Which, um, you know, I don't know if people know what that is. It's, uh, no. you know, one of the Elder, Stro- Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. Part 5 is uh, Skyrim. You probably heard of Skyrim. Oh, yeah, Skyrim, yeah. yeah so it's the- Sorry, I'm oblivious of Oblivion. <laughs> it's the Elder Scrolls series, really good games, so? right? <laughs> so Oblivion, um, you know, it's the same type of thing, right? So I'm playing the game, and I start hearing the voice. The king is talking to me. I'm hearing the voice. Oh, oh thank you very much. That's, no, not that. <laughs> that sounds like Elvis. <laughs> it's actually, anyway, bring me some cheeseburgers and some French fried potatoes. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> it's actually Shakespearean-trained actor Patrick Stewart playing the oh. king in Oblivion. So it, that blew me away. I was like, oh, man, Patrick Stewart's, you know what I mean? And then you look at games like uh, Grand Theft Auto, and yeah. I couldn't even list them off to you. It's like 50 bus actors contributing to the game, oh, yeah. from uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Ray Liotta, yeah. to right down to Boss Rutten, you know? But yeah, but I thought the dialogue was pretty bad in Oblivion. I mean, I stopped short of, Well, point, yeah, right? short of Patrick Stewart, though. Yeah, I was, I was actually, uh, when I was, I was listening to the one... Uh, no, no, the writing. Podcast. Oh, the writing. I was listening to this one podcast uh, that concentrates on voice acting, and in one of the episodes they were talking about, uh, you know, doing the voice work for uh, video games, and they were saying that while doing voice work for video games has become far more prevalent than, say, cartoons by by a mile, the the problem with doing the voices the voiceover work for video games is that, you know, you. You basically have to space out the recording sessions because you're sp- you're spending more than half of your time just doing death screams. And <laughs> oh yeah, and they were saying like uh, if you know when you're doing the day that you do all, record all your de- all the possible deaths in the game, you 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 save that till Friday so that then you have two days to recover your voice <laughs> because you're basically tearing your voice to sh- your your uh, vocal cords to shreds. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I remember um, something that Rogan talks about when he was doing uh, the UFC video games. Yes, you don't like Joe Rogan? No, I was, I was, I, I was, actually, I do. I, oh, very good. So when he's talking about doing the uh, recordings for the UFC video games, and it's it's incredibly tedious, and he says he does it mm-hmm. as a favor for the guys because they want him in there, he, not for the money. It's just the worst possible thing, he says, because you're it's so repetitive. You know yeah. what I mean? You're saying the same thing over and over with a little variation for all the different names and uh, characters and all that. Or a little but, slightly different inflection, slightly different speed. Yeah. 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 Or but, do uh, it on an up uh, up tone and then finish it on a down tone instead. It's, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. It's, but it's you, know what, you know what? The, the thing is, is, as epic as all these things are, and, and, and let me tell you, I, I love listening to, you know, you know, actors that I, that I know of and, and so forth in, in the video games and whatnot. I have to say that just like movies, just like music, the technology has uh, enabled people to to take it from something that was once not possible to do. Like to for 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 me to go to a a, a gaming workshop and say I can now make a video game back in the day would be a ridiculous concept. But nowadays there are so many tools out there. Now we've got these things. I mean, they're not new indie games. Yep. Indie games are making a huge comeback now, and for anyone who doesn't know what an indie game is, it's basically a smaller version, self, usually self-produced video game, independent game, that you know, somebody or somebody, small group of people create, and usually the music is basic, or if any, um, or the sound effects are, are basic, if any, the graphics are usually basic, if any, um, but it brings it back down to where a common person we have a common person that can you know learn um some some code or can can purchase a, a gaming kit that have some templates and some basic code to help them get going and we are now at you know have the ability to create our own games just like how websites were impossible you know you had to get a webmaster to have a website built for you to do the html code and now pretty much anybody can go to godaddy and their own website similar for for some computer games now we're not going to get the the call of duty graphics or the call of duty immersion but 
there are still a lot of really good gaming ideas out there, and you know this uh, because you can go to any website, type in free games, and get ridiculous number of free online games of various quality, and they let you play for free because they know that they have things in the game that could get you to spend money. And for those people that will spend money, they will make money because their production is, you know, they don't have all that overhead. And I suppose once it becomes popular enough, they yes. could, they could, if and when it becomes more popular, uh, they can always create a Kickstarter for it to yeah. to to actually fund a more uh, high quality version of the game, couldn't they? Or not, or just you know, just you know, redo what they just did. Yeah, they have both options. Exactly. That's the thing. You know, we were talking about the voice acting, and another thing, obviously, is the graphics. That's what yeah. really brings the price up. So when you have these really high budget games that are the mainstream games, the Call of Duties and that it's when you have a, a company, right? And say, okay, we're going to make a game, it's going to be a great game, high, all this stuff. So what game are you going to make? Are you going to make a, a Tetris? Or, no, we have to make what sells? What's out there? First person shooter? Okay, let's make one of those yeah. because we have to. And so you don't get any kind of risk being mm-hmm. taken. So that's where these indie games came in and I think they kind of Save the video game industry from just this spiral into endless first-person shooter games, you know? I agree. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think the, in- the indie game scene is in a weird place right now. It, it was in the beginning in the fame, which was roughly 94 to 2002, which would have been Master of Orion 2 to Mafia 1, just in my opinion, maybe like 2003, 2004. Um, companies would bankrupt themselves in order to polish out a fine diamond of a game, right? Yes. So in, in, so they, they all kind of died out, you know, com- companies like Looking Glass Studios and stuff like that. Then there was the big budget games. And I think as, a, as an interesting reaction to that, it seems like the indie scene is coming full circle, back to the sort of the way it was in the golden era, but not uh, bankrupting themselves, you know, um, in that way. Um, but I, I, I think it, there's a weird thing that's going on with the prices. So you have something like Steam as a platform for these independent games, and everyone's competing. It's, it's kind of like a race to the bottom, if you look at the pricing scheme. It's like developers are going to price their games lower and lower so that they'll get people, people to buy it. Huh, Multiplayer... Multiplayer games are having a really hard time getting off the ground because it's like a chicken and egg thing. So a developer puts out a multiplayer game. People are like, well, are people going to buy this or not? Should I buy in now or should I wait? Um, so then you have something like a, a game like Ark just taking off like hugely coming out of left field from nowhere. Uh, that's like an online dinosaur game, and I guess that was made popular because of the Jurassic yeah. Park movies and stuff like that. But I mean, a lot of uh, the vast majority of of multiplayer only games don't go anywhere because like people are so wary of buying them. Yeah, that's hu- hurting developers. Like, like that's hu- hurting developers in the in the pocketbooks. So um, they're sort of taking risks, and then you have the backlash against crowdfunding. Mm-hmm. So I mean, in the beginning, like crowdfunding was. What, what do you guys think about uh, crowdfunding? In the beginning, it seemed like a great idea, a great way for... Uh, what, is, what is crowdfunding again? Like Kickstarter. Uh, yeah. From, from what groups, though? Crowdfunding is basically like um, they have a bunch of websites where they allow someone to come up and uh, basically give you a concept for a game. Like, you know, this is going to be a third-person uh, shooter, whatever. And um, they have a goal of a certain amount of money they want to raise. And oh, people right, are... Right, right. Yeah. So they it, kick it's in a way of, way of bypassing the publisher, the, the middleman. It's kind of like if you were making a Hollywood movie, you would have to sacrifice your creative control uh, and bow down to the altar of the gods who are giving you the money. So with crowdfunding, you can ask people if they would support your... It's not just for games, though. You could actually crowdfund, theoretically. Like, you could crowdfund uh, an invention you're trying to develop or... You or know a what movie I mean? or a... Bo- yeah, or... anything. Sure. Right. In, the, in the beginning, it was for games, but uh, then people started uh, uh, trying really hard to, uh, to make their own independent movie. Like, for example, um, I, I actually suggested to, uh, to Jack Fresco and, and Roxanne that they, they crowdfund the movie that they wanted to make, which is uh, Paradise or Oblivion. 
think Beyond Heaven or Hell, Heaven or Hell, Paradise or Blevin, I think it was called. And also, Sierra wanted to uh, to make a movie, and I, I sent an email and told him that he could try and crowdfund uh, a movie. So, and then later on, Sirius came out. Stephen Greer was the guy who uh, he was responsible for the disclosure project in, t- in 2001. He basically had 500 different witnesses. Um, high-level witnesses like the military and the FAA. They basically wanted the government, the, especially the U.S. government, to come clean on, on UFOs and stuff like that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. They can't do that because that'll... How many games are we going to lose because of that? <laughs> and then there was that... Uh, <laughs> from, the other, from the other end of that spectrum, there was that uh, German director, I think his name was uh, Uwe Boll, who's notorious for making really awful uh, movies on video games. And he tried to make one more movie and get it crowdfunded, and he couldn't get even one percent of his stated goal. And so he posted on YouTube a video, basically telling every, telling the whole world that they could, literally telling everybody that they could go fuck themselves for not for, for not supporting his project. <laughs> I've heard that he gets a lot of hate. Yeah, um, so people hate him. I don't know the details of why. Well, okay, then, let's say he's a bad director or something. Yeah. Oh, bad actor, I'm not sure. No director. Uh, he's uh, most most people in Hollywood, from what I understand, consider him to be the worst uh, movie director since Ed Wood. Oh, but you know what? Time line from out of space. Even, even yeah. that kind of uh, they say any any kind of uh, notoriety is good notoriety when it comes to trying to sell your product. Yeah, sure. The problem that I see with the crowdfunding is that I think people are getting fatigued with it because what's happening is that people are pouring money into the games. The developers, the indie developers have all piles and piles of money and then they think to themselves, wow, we have all this money, why bother even making the game? Well, they, they push out like a half-inch product. So here's, a, here's an age-old question. What would you say some of your favorite video games were? And let's, let's say, you know, we're, we're talking mostly about computer uh, video games, not necessarily the, the arcade ones. But, you know, like, for example, one of the earlier games that I always got a kick out of, we talked about it before, was uh, Leisure Suit Larry. Do you guys remember that one? Leave yeah, it to Larry in the land of the lounge lizards. <laughs> like, really? Okay. You can't be so, serious. <laughs> well, I mean, it's one of those things that it was really entertaining that they would let us play something like this. But yet it was intriguing to try to see how far you could actually go. You know, it wasn't like some of the other video games where, you know, you shot stuff or you dodged stuff constantly. This was something a little more, you know, tongue-in-cheek, a little interactive, a little bit risque <laughs> in a funny way. <laughs> No, I thought it was about as interesting as amateur porn from the 70s, but go ahead. <laughs> well, it wasn't in the 70s. What is it? No, that was the <laughs> it's a leisure day. suit. <laughs> no. You know, my first reaction to Leisure Suit Larry, I was 10 years old when I played that game. Oh, dear. Okay? <laughs> so my main thing was trying to answer skill-testing questions from the 70s to even play the game. You know, at 10 years old, right? It's crazy. <laughs> That's all I remember. <laughs> Any well, other games that really how, grabbed how you, Dave? Uh, Andrew, uh, wait, yeah, uh, my number one is My Magic Six. So my my number one game is uh, My Magic Six, the ma- the Mandate of Heaven. And the funny story behind that is that uh, I didn't actually in that game. A friend asked me if I wanted to play, and I told him uh, no because RPGs suck balls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how dare you! <laughs> how dare you! He was like, oh, I, don't, I don't understand. And you got to realize he was younger. And he asked, well, in the eighties, RPGs were like eat food, walk north, you fall down a hole, you die, and then you start over again, and you have to f- try and figure out this, this stupid path the developer figured out, and I'm like, that, that's bullshit, I don't want to play like that, so he's like, you know, try it, it's really, 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 really good, so I started playing it, um, it was an epic game that took me three months to play, that's like ten hours a day, every day, <laughs> and it was like my number one game of all time on any format, number two game is Master of Orion 2, which was a... Um, for a strategy game, and um, I read that the MIT coders coded their artificial intelligence for that. So it's basically fighting, playing that game, and fighting the AI was looked like a scene from Terminator 2, where like the the Schwarzenegger is fighting Robert Patrick, like T100 just versus, versus the T1000 because the, the AI was brutal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that game, man. Yeah, it was great. The, the third game is uh, Knights of the Old Republic One, which is also an RPG. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's I thought you said RPGs suck balls. 
I know. I, I, I love this game. Okay, well, you can, you can, you can, you can contemplate the sucking of balls with RPGs. <laughs> Pete, what do you think? As he plays hmm? his RPG. Oh, oh, favorite video games? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's a, it's a tie between three dozen. But uh, <laughs> Let's I mean, uh, two, off the top please, of my two. head, um, you know, I like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics. Was a big one for me. You know, love that game. And um, Fallout 2? Epic. Fallout. Just, it's still my favorite Fallout game, Fallout 2. Is that but... the one with the portable trunk from the car? Yes. <laughs> In the bug for it, yeah. <laughs> that if you guys out. haven't played it or, or know what it is, you can surely see videos all about it. Okay. But um, I think my favorite video game hasn't really been made yet. If I was going to make a game, I'll base it on my favorite movie... Which is it's a it's a mix of my favorite genres. You got fantasy with sci-fi and uh, right. action drama. I don't know if you guys seen it. It's um Highlander Two: The Quickening. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fantasy. Seen, uh, seen oh, that one? Uh, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well done. Okay, <laughs> so I guess I'm going to be the really old fart in this story. Uh, my f- my all-time favorite games, uh, one was an arcade game called... Pong! No, <laughs> it was called Exciting Hour. It was a wrestling video game. I played them so much, I ended up having to tip up my fingertips. <laughs> because I kept, Old school. Because I kept wow, hitting the really buttons. Hardcore. Oh, yeah. And my other game uh, would have to be Doom 2. I really loved playing yeah. that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially when I discovered that there was Wolfenstein, a secret Wolfenstein level, <laughs> where you could where you could kill Nazis galore. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a game that I actually did enjoy uh, quite a bit. It was called Dungeon Keeper, or Dungeon Master, and basically you were the evil master building a dungeon in a mountain or something like that, and you had to you had these little minions that you would use to build the passageways that you wanted in the dungeon, and as you acquire experience, you could start building more powerful monsters, and you have to train them, but then periodically you had these pesky adventurers that would come into your dungeon, and they would try to ransack your dungeon and steal your gold, and you had to fight off the evil heroes from, <laughs> from Amiga. But the thing that was really funny about this game, and this was uh, uh, it was on my Amiga, I think it was, and um, the really amazing thing was is that they had it date tied, so you so if it was like Christmas, there was a secret thing that would open up at Christmas time, or a Halloween thing that would open up at Halloween time, and you would never necessarily know um, that that they had this, this secret um, uh, event in Easter the egg. game itself. Easter egg is what they call it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly, exactly. You know and what? That was awesome. the, I, I think there's a game out there now, or two games out there now. That would be right up your right up your alley then in that, in that sort of uh, vein. I think it's called Overlord and Overlord Two, where you basically play the bad guy and you've got these little goblin minions. And I think and can in, you smack them? Oh yeah! <laughs> and in the second game, you can also like kill pandas and, and club seals to death. And, well, actually, there was another and game that kill was... uni- unicorns and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's my my kids love that game. There was a game called Just... Smurf Hunt way back in the day too. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> where you got to play Gargamel and. And his cat, I think, and he had a shotgun. As well. <laughs> and he had a shotgun <laughs> to kill the sperm. Yeah. yeah. And on that happy sperm. note, I think we're going to have to call it, call it a night from yeah, there. Yeah, we're getting... Uh, so, we're getting... very quickly, uh, 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 while this isn't exactly a geek talk back, uh, Dave, you were asking me in episode 5 about... Uh, asked a lot of things. Uh, yeah, but I promised you that I'd find out what happened to Jacques Cousteau in terms of his uh, burial, because yes, that's right. you wanted that's to know right. if he was buried at sea. That's and right, we didn't get to it in the last one. I'm sorry to inform you, no, he was not buried at sea. He, he was He was buried in his family's mausoleum in France. Oh. Yeah, full, Catholic, full Catholic burial. That's what I plan to do. You know, when I when I pass on, I'm gonna fan, you know. You're gonna get, get buried, buried in a mausoleum estate. with Jacques Cousteau. With my my family estate, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> with my horses and my crown. <laughs> <laughs> Is that gonna be here in Canada or down in the Caribbean? <laughs> It's going to be back to the other topic we were talking about, which was fantasies. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, Pete, Andrew, uh, for two whole episodes. You guys have been great. Um, yes, thank you. And thank for the listeners to, for listening and, and some of the crack, crackleness. We apologize. That's what happens when we 
try stuff and it doesn't always work, but the material is awesome. Yeah, maybe, yeah Skype bows. Yeah, maybe we Skype, should crowd Skype those goats. And and Pete wants to plug you you porn or yes, something. Yes, uh yeah, Pete, <laughs> there was something you wanted right. to discuss really quickly. Yeah, you you won't find it on you porn. It's this group um they're called RPG Brigade. And since, you know, we are rooted in role playing games here, it's a group they they raise awareness yeah. for gaming and all that stuff, right? Uh so it's a it's a page on Facebook called RPG Brigade, and they set up this thing called Brigade Con, like a convention. So uh-huh. BrigadeCon.org, you can go, and they basically have a, a date in October where they got 24 hours of gaming going on, right? So you, you can go in... Like face-to-face? No, it's over the internet. Oh. But what you do is you can go on there and either run a game yourself or join a game. There's any kind of uh, uh, paper and pencil RPG games, board games, video games, um, and they arrange most of it through Google Hangouts or right through Twitch or uh, Roll D20, I think it's it's called. And um, Yeah, it, it's, re- it's really good because they're doing it for Child's Play. It's this um, charity where they get video game consoles and help things out to like kids in hospitals or long-term care centers oh, to cool. help awesome. ease the pain, you know? That's awesome. Okay, well, Pete, I, maybe you can just say how people can find out more and how people can volunteer again, just to make sure it's clear. Yeah, guys can go right on to um, uh, RPG Brigade on Facebook or BrigadeCon.org to, to sign up for the convention, and uh, it's all free, and there's prizes. And, uh, okay, and you can see that address on your screen. In the awesome. video. In the video, guys. In the video. In the, you don't <laughs> see it on your screen on Skype. Right? <laughs> That's great, man. <laughs> okay. So thanks a lot. We'll, we'll, uh, please, ch- everybody, do check out BrigadeCon.org. That sounds like a very good cause to me. Uh, it didn't help the kids, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Anyway. Awesome. Okay. So that's it for the latest uh, episode of Geek Talk MD. Tune next time when God knows what we're going to talk about. So I, I don't know. <laughs> so pack up your lucky dice, put away the Chinese food menus. And if you're going to order a number two combo, please order one with no peas. Indeed. Thank you and good night. Good night, all. <laughs>